I think in the West we are not really paying attention. Mm -hmm. uh, our industry has moved to China for most things and the lighting industry has very much moved to China. What we need to be aware of is no longer do the West necessarily lead lighting innovation, mm. but we become consumers and users of it. Um, the, we're beginning to see innovation here, um, and that's kind of why I'm here to see what is coming next. I mean, China has gone poof, yes, and the, the local market has massively got bigger. So not, you know, it's now mm. you know, an industry for China, not just mm. for selling internationally. However, China now dominates the international marketplace as well. Yeah, and it's, I think it's impossible to buy any lighting product in Europe and the UK that doesn't have some, if not most, Chinese components. Welcome back. In this episode of the Virtual Lighting Design Community Podcast, we had the opportunity to interview Kevin Shaw, who was one of the keynote speakers at the Guangzhou International Lighting Exhibition held in China back in June 2023. The Virtual Lighting Design Community had the honor of collaborating with Messe Frankfurt for this prestigious event. Industry luminaries like Kevin Shaw shared their experiences in China and provided valuable insights into the local lighting industry. Kevin offers a glimpse into the challenges, the opportunities and future prospects of the lighting sector in this dynamic region. We are excited to share this conversation with you. A bit about Kevin now. He has established himself as a leading expert in the industry. As the founder of his own independent lighting practice in Edinburgh, Scotland, he has consistently pushed boundaries and received numerous accolades for his innovative approach and problem-solving abilities. Beyond his practice, Kevin has actively contributed to the European lighting community, serving as a consultant to the European Commission and sharing regulatory outcomes with fellow professionals. He has also made significant contributions to lighting education, teaching at esteemed institutions such as Wismar and Edinburgh Napier University. Recognized for his exceptional work, Shaw has received prestigious awards including the Lighting Designer of the Year in 2013 and the Lit Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018. Again, a special shout out to our premium supporters Aero Light, Creative Lighting Asia, Erco and the Signified Lighting Academy for their continued support. You can also check us out on YouTube. Our handle is vld.community. And also check out our online community where we all come together as industry peers. That's at www.vld.community. Now let's get on with the show. Enjoy this conversation with Kevin Shaw as he talks with Martin Klassen. Welcome to the Virtual Line Design Community. We are in uh, Guangzhou, uh, attending the Guangzhou International Lighting Exhibition. Uh, we've just completed our event, um, East Meets West, uh, where the main topic was uh, lighting for health and well-being. Uh, my guest is uh, Kevin Shaw, one of the eminent speakers at the event. Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Um, first question for those who don't know you, who is Kevin, where does he live, and what does he do in his daily life? Right, I am a lighting designer. I feel almost like I'm saying that, as you say, I am an alcoholic. Because lighting is an addiction. Yes. Um, I think the polite thing to say would be a vocation. Hmm. Um, I live and work in Edinburgh. Uh, I do work, at this point, it changes from time to time. At this point, mostly in the UK and in Northern Europe and Scandinavia. But uh, I've worked all over the world, except in China. Anybody got a job? Mm. But uh, I'm, yeah, I'm a lighting designer. I've been involved in lighting one way or another pretty much since I left university. Um, but I didn't study it there. I studied economic and, so uh, economic and technological history and social psychology as a joint honours degree. Um, and my route into professional lighting was through stage lighting. Uh, I got involved in that in university and I ended up, uh, when I left, practicing as a lighting designer and working as lighting crew, mostly with rock and roll bands for yeah. the best part of 10 years. So in the, end, well, in the end of the 1980s, I set up my own practice and returned to Edinburgh because I've been living in London. Uh, and uh, I've been pretty much doing that ever since. 
So this is not your first time in China because I know we have met here before. Mm, yes. I'm not sure whether we met here in Guangzhou, in Chongqing or somewhere, one of those yeah. events. I know you've been to China, but it's been a while, I think, uh, quite a number of years from before COVID. Yeah. Um, well, what's yep. your impression right now? My impression? Um, uh, that of a maturing market um, for lighting, mm. I think, I think in the West we are not really paying attention. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, lighting has moved from a Western thing uh, because of lots of economic and political reasons. Uh, industry has moved to China for most things, and mm. the lighting industry has very much moved to China. Yes. So I think what we need to be aware of is no longer do the West necessarily lead lighting innovation, mm. but we become consumers and users of it. Um, the, we're beginning to see innovation here, um, and that's kind of why I'm here to see what is coming next. Right. Um, whereas it used to be, you see the innovation maybe in Frankfurt, and then you see the copies here a year or two later. Mm. So first time I came to this exhibition was 2015, and it, it has changed in character quite a bit. The first time I came, it was all about selling. It was almost all relatively low quality, very cheap stuff. Right. Now I'm here, what I'm seeing is a lot of stuff that is intended for the local market. I mean, you've got stands saying no export on them. Right. Oh, really? So, I didn't yes. see that. Oh, okay. oh yeah. No, they, ah. the local market, I mean, China has gone poof. Yes. And it, the local market has massively got bigger. So not, you know, it's now mm. you know, an industry for China, not just... Hmm. for selling internationally. However, China now dominates the international marketplace as well. Yeah. And it's, I think it's impossible to buy any lighting product in Europe and the UK it's not that, somewhere that, here. Doesn't, that doesn't have some, if not most, Chinese components. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah I mean, most lighting manufacturers are based here. There's close to 10,000 LED manufacturers in yeah. China alone. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, it makes yeah. sense. I mean, even, even the big all the big brands have factories in China. Well, yeah, they have factories in China or they just buy from the Chinese. Yeah. Oh, they buy, yeah, um, absolutely. I think, yeah, the idea of the Western company, the factory here is sometimes a bit of a, a false suit for marketing purposes. Um, mm. There's a lot of OEM manufacture here. Um, there's a lot of contract manufacture. So mm. uh, a Western company will specify a like product. And this has happened in, ex extensively with LED lamps, replacement lamps, mm. you, know, you, know, you know, the ordinary ES or BC yeah. general lamp, they're made here. Mm. And even if they're branded by a major Western company, what they started to do was they, they gave up with lamps when they lost the previous technologies. So they come here and they will write a specification, they'll bid the specification to a number of mm. companies for a quantity. They'll buy that quantity from the best price few months later when they need more they'll do it again and every now and then it goes wrong because what happens is the they spec that they wrote can't be met anymore by the company so they lose a product all oh, right okay and that's that's happened to us on a couple of projects with quite significant consequences oh, right. interesting so you are here to participate in in our event as a, as a speaker uh, on uh, light for health and well-being um, tell us a little bit about your topic and uh, maybe what your biggest takeaway was from all the discussions that we had around that topic. All right, well, what I wanted to do, I mean, light and well-being has kind of got funneled into one area, particularly, which is um, circadian impacts. And, you know, we've even co-opted a whole term mm -hmm. for this. Uh, so. What I want to do is to go through a lot more of the impacts of light mm -hmm. on us as human beings, as entities, as animals, and as social beings. Uh, because it's not just the diurnal lighting, that's a very tiny, tiny part of how light impacts us. So I tried in a relatively short time to get mm -hmm. through an awful lot of stuff. I don't know how. I know you were given a short across. time, I know. Yeah. Right? I don't know whether I got it across quite enough or not. But, um, uh, well, that's why we have recorded the, yeah. the session so people can take their time at their own convenience to listen again.
All right, so yeah. the takeaway for this is, listen to my talk two or three times, you might get it. <laughs> <laughs> but was there anything that stand, stood out for you? Like, what, what's your biggest takeaway from, from the various topics that were presented? Um, I, well, I think on two things that are diametrically opposed. Hmm. On one hand, there's not much difference hmm. between East and West in terms of what's wanted. And on the hmm. other hand, there are some very cultural influences which seem to expect different mm -hmm. outcomes and different things. And I, I think maybe it's about quantity of light to an extent. Which well, so I've always viewed like the Western approach about quality and the Eastern approach about quantity. It's not maybe doing it justice, but and that seems to balance, start to balance out a bit. So like Jack, you rightfully mentioned, yeah. I feel that the differences are becoming less and less. Yeah. It's growing towards each other. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's reasonable. I think yeah. there's a good cross-fertilization across yeah. 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 The, uh, the, I don't know, is it a geograph geographical divide or a cultural divide? I feel probably... Or both. Yeah. <laughs> but I, th I, think the, I think the real big takeaway, though, is that actually from a physiological point of view and to a large extent from a psychological point of view we all react in the same way to light yes i mean it, 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 there's no you know racial difference or um no no physical but, but difference in another way you difference. have people that appreciate lighting still differently some people find bright more pleasant other like dim more pleasant i mean they're still from culture background sometimes a different appreciation of light no well with the, with the, the bright and dim I think one point that didn't really come across yeah. at all we didn't really get a chance to explore it was the fact that if you let people loose with a lighting control system the natural thing for people to do in most situations is make it as bright as possible yeah and I, I think it's, it's easily explained mm. as, I, as I said in my talk we have not evolved into this artificially lit life. We evolved as an outdoor species. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, you know, hunter gatherers. Then we were in an agrarian society, um, and we spent most of our time outdoors. Two centuries we've been brought indoors, and you know, we still inherently, I think, crave the outdoor brightness and the outdoor feeling. Certainly during the day, mm -hmm. at night not so much. It's a different mm -hmm. thing. Right. So, I, th I think that that is something, and I think maybe there's a bit more expressiveness in the client end of make it brighter right. here in the, in the or in certain areas in the east than there is in, in the west. Interesting. Okay. Now I'm here as a representative of uh, virtual language design community. You have contributed to that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, now that you have had time to to get a bit of a better feel of, of what we do as a, as a community. Um, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts? A bit, we're now a year further down the road. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's what's astonished me is it has taken so long for a virtual lighting community to, to start to develop. Right. I mean, if, if, you know, the internet has been around since the mid-1990s. Mm. And I, okay, maybe I'm just an early adopter of things, but uh, you know, I hoped and thought that we'd start getting involved with the internet. I mean, lighting is, has a technical component to it, so you hmm. expect people to be comfortable with technology. Yeah. But really, there have been no, until now, there have been no takeoffs of virtual communities, no real engagements with, even with the platforms like Facebook or Twitter yeah. or, or LinkedIn maybe a little bit more, but they've yeah. not really got the lighting community together in the mm. way VLDC is now, mm. now doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So quite why it should have taken 20 years, I don't know, but I'm really glad it's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we didn't know when we started it, but it's really by the community, for the community. We, we really want people to reach out to each other and, and provide a platform that lives on beyond events like this, where we meet face to face. It's nice yeah. to see you again, by the way. <laughs> but it's nice to be able to keep in touch afterwards, and that's what the platform also aims to, to be doing. So, yeah. Now, um, a more personal question. <laughs> What drives Kevin Shaw out of bed in the morning? What's your passion? What's the drive that gets you to do what you do every day? Um, 
Do you know the spring said, chicken anymore, right? <laughs> it's like, no. Uh, but you're still running around. I'm still running around. I'm still doing it. I still enjoy it. I still mm. enjoy the creative aspects. I think the thing that lighting does more than maybe anything else I'm aware of is you have to be constantly learning. Yeah. There's constant change, um, technological change. Uh, and I mean, that, that's, that's been there forever since I've been in lighting. Mm. But in the last uh, 15, 10, 15 years, we've had a very compressed technological change. Mm. Uh, and we have junked pretty much all the light source technologies we had for LED. And it's, it's not just been a natural thing. Previous generations of change have been quite organic and natural. Mm. There's been some time, a new thing has come in, you had a chance to get used to it and then mm. deal with it. Because of external pressures, and not the least of which is climate change and mm. energy use, uh, we have been regulated into an entirely LED world faster yeah. than the technology has been maturing. Mm. So I think maybe now we're beginning to get technology that is, you know, that should have been there when we adopted LEDs 10 years ago. So now is, now is you know, there's no, we don't have a choice anymore. Mm. We're using LEDs. But we have a choice to be able to understand more about exactly the qualities of the LEDs we're using and focus on the higher end of it. But I've drifted totally away from this, the original point, why do I do this? To learn, to teach actually. Mm. I, I really enjoy mentoring people yeah. and bringing people up and enthusing them with my enthusiasm, yeah. enthusiasm for, for light and lighting. Um, and I, I said there's a sort of quasi religious vocational aspect to lighting mm. design. Mm. So um, I might be getting on, but I'm not at this point, yeah. you know, I'm not jaded by it. I'm still, I think there's, there's still more to do, more that can be done and yeah. more opportunities for me to explore ideas, concepts and creativity. So you've seen a lot of change coming through in our profession. Um, you may have frustrations about some things. What, what, if you could change something, if, there's, if you had a magic wand and you could change something within the lighting industry, is there something you say, ah, oh, please, if we could change this, or what would that be? It would be our whole approach to metrics of light. Right. Radically. Right down, the V lambda curve, gone. Right. The lumen, gone. We have been driven, and it's, it's not, a drift, it's a drive, into measuring illuminance. Mm. That is the amount of light that lands on a surface. Mm. And that is actually totally irrelevant. We don't experience illuminance, we experience luminance. We experience the light that comes back from everything, mm. the reflective light. Emotion, yeah. And you know, it's, it's not, you know, why are we measuring the thing that we, we don't see? And we have, you know, we can't measure unless we create an instrument specifically designed to measure it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in terms of what we've been talking about now in health and well-being, the limitations of the lumen and the V lambda curve have become even more apparent because if, you know, now we understand how light optically mm. changes other things in our bodies, but it's nothing to do with the V lambda curve, it's, it's a whole different part of the spectrum. So why are we measuring something that's ineffective and trying to force that into something that has this other effect? Mm. So I would throw out the entirety of <laughs> lighting metrics to start again. Sounds like a plan. Now that probably ties in with my next question about the future. Um, yeah. Is there a place for artificial intelligence to replace all that? Artificial intelligence to or replace what? The lighting design? No, the old, the, what you just said, what you want to change. Because you, you, you throw it out, does it need to be replaced? Because now we're looking at oh, smart okay. lighting uh, fixtures, uh, we're looking at artificial okay. intelligence, we're looking at, now it's chat GPT, I don't know, all kinds of things that right. are happening. I think there's two, two different strands to answer here. Right. Um, yes, we can replace it. Yeah. Uh, and work has been done. I know we've come across Kit Cuttle. Mm. Yes, of course. His work, uh, his LIDOS, yeah. LIDOS system, yeah. it essentially replaces, it, it, it uses the num numbering, it still uses V lambda cover and all that lambda, all that stuff is in there. But at least from a design perspective, it gives mm. us a chance to mm. 
work with what we see and what impacts us yeah. rather yeah, than yeah, 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 yeah. what lands. But um, <clears throat> we missed out on the opportunity to do that a long time ago. Because the I mean, papers were being written as far back as the 1930s and brightness design as opposed to uh, illumination design mm. was being developed and practiced right through into the late 1940s and early yeah, 1950s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it all disappeared. It got dissolved under this mm. uh, load of illuminance. Mm. Um, artificial intelligence. Mm. Uh, to be honest, I have played with ChatGPT. I thought it might be quite interesting to put some lighting concepts yeah. in and see if I could get it to write my talks for me. Right. No. No. Not yet, maybe. Well, not not yet. The output is as good as the input, and I think well, one of the things also: how do you define the right input to get the right output, or right? Well, or right. It, it is to an extent. The, th the thing is that these things can't yet think for themselves. They mm. can't come up with an original idea. All they can do is repeat and parrot back what the accepted wisdom is. Yep. That in itself is dangerous because that is a potential for preventing change, development, new ideas mm. and new thinking coming into, yeah. into it. Yeah. If, if everything comes out as something that's been fed by the past, right. we, stop, we, we, we suddenly yeah, exactly. don't have a future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the potential for it to be a problem solver, I think there is, there is mm. an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I presume that means VL DC is going to get its own AI and probably who knows. I mean, where I where I absolutely think it would be brilliant is to help us with um, product research because yeah. what we're looking at is turning facts into information and filtering. Mm. Now, I'm sure an AI could do that with much more efficiency and with much less boredom than me going through endless catalogues or trawling right. the web trying to find exactly what I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I could get uh, an AI to deliver me mm. some options for a spec, um, f from a, you know, that would be a brilliant tool to have. It would be interesting to see where we go. Maybe if we chat in a year or two from now, things will be totally different. Yeah. Kevin, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks for your contribution. Well, I've enjoyed it. it. I yeah, always enjoy talking and enjoy lighting and yeah. enjoy traveling here. Thank you very, thank much. very much. Thank you. And that wraps up another enlightening episode of the VLDZ podcast. We hope you enjoyed our discussion with Kevin Shaw, a true luminary in the world of lighting design. We want to take a moment to express our gratitude to all our listeners for tuning in and supporting the show. Your feedback and reviews mean the world to us. So if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform. It helps us reach more people and continue bringing you fascinating conversations and insights. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel where you'll find video versions of our podcast episodes, behind the scenes content and exclusive interviews with industry experts. And don't miss out on joining our vibrant online community where you can connect with fellow lighting enthusiasts, share knowledge and collaborate on exciting projects. Thank you once again for joining us on this illuminating journey. Until next time, see you there.